This is Duke University. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Hope you're all doing well. Thank you for joining us for the sixth Duke Gen Angel Pitch event. My name is Howie Ree, and I am the Managing Director at the Center for in Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Fuqua School of Business. I work at Duke, and I'm also one of the co-chairs of Duke Gen. Uh, delighted to have you join us tonight. We're also streaming live on YouTube, so uh, welcome to all of our folks who are watching us on YouTube. Um, tonight, we are going to have uh, six teams present their startup ideas to our panel of investors and special guests. And we are going to uh, select the winner and wish them well as they uh, go off into the startup world. I'm joined here by Alex Cutler, Megan Gallagher, and John Miles, who are our planning committee. They are all Duke alumni. And uh, we are thrilled to be here at Google's offices. So uh, before we begin, let me actually ask you a couple of questions. First of all, how many of you have been to a Duke Gen event before? Raise your hand. Okay, great. So that's wonderful. I see that probably about half of our audience has not been to a Duke Gen event. I'm actually going to talk us through a little bit about what Duke Gen is about, just to familiarize everybody with um, what we have going on here. So Duke Gen started in 2008 to answer this question, how do you connect Dukies that are interested in startups? And so um, Duke Gen is all about creating productive connections, and hopefully you've met some interesting people here tonight and are in the process of making those connections. So in 2008, we didn't have any Duke members of Duke Gen, and now we have 5,000 members on our LinkedIn group. This makes us the largest university-based entrepreneurship group on LinkedIn, and we're also the third largest Duke group on LinkedIn behind only the uh, official Alumni Association and the official Fuqua groups. So what does that mean for you and for other Dukies? So one thing is that by connect, being connected on LinkedIn, you get to access the collective wisdom of Duke alumni everywhere. So here you see an example of Chandra, who's a Duke alum, whom I've actually never met, who posted a question asking about help about a domain name. And you see that there are 40, 24 comments here. And I'm going to scroll down a little bit so you can see how, um, how detailed those were. So uh, just kind of people from all over, um, all schools at Duke kind of contributed ideas to Chandra's question. And so that's how we got started, is these kind of discussions and getting people connected. And the next thing we said, again, back in 2008, was how can we get people connected um, in person? And so we started doing these networking events, which you see pictured here. And what we've done is we've done these networking events three times a year on the same night in multiple cities, all through volunteer efforts with, with no budget. And so since 2008, we've hosted 100 events in the likes of these cities, and I won't uh, say all of them, but you can see them listed there. And so in fact, tonight's event is part of our 11th round of these multi-city networking events. And we are in the following cities here, um, which I'll just briefly touch on, Atlanta, Chicago, Cincinnati, Mumbai, New Jersey, here in New York, Orange County, California, uh, Durham, San Diego, San Francisco, Seattle, and Washington, DC. And so uh, we have over 500 people RSVP to these various events, and it's just a great way for us to connect entrepreneurial Dukies in their geographies. So finally, what I want to mention about Duke Gen is that we've been putting together a lot of online resources for folks like you who may be interested in starting a company. And so a few things that we offer are a list of Duke investors here. We have um, over 100 investors listed here. We have profiles of Duke alumni, about 40 interviews here, including the founders of Melissa and Doug, Mint.com, and Zico, which if you didn't know, are all started by Duke alumni. And um, in addition, we put together these angel pitch events. So just to show you quickly in pictures uh, where these angel pitches, pitch events have come from, they started a couple years ago in San Francisco. Uh, we actually just said, hey, can we invite um, eight Duke startups to pitch to a panel of Duke alumni, as you see here. And uh, Ryan Spoon, who you see on the left, is joining us again tonight. He's uh, right here on the front row in front of a Duke audience. So this was actually at Dogpatch Labs um, in San Francisco. So that was the first event. We said, let's do it again in New York. So here are eight uh, Duke startups pitching to a panel of Duke investors in front of a Duke audience. This is at Dogpatch Labs near Union Square here in New York. We did it again in San Francisco. 
And so uh, we're here now at our sixth event, as I mentioned. So finally, I want to say that uh, what are some ways that you can get involved in DukeGen? So please visit our website at dukegen.com. Also join our LinkedIn discussion group if you haven't already. Again, we have 5,000 members. Um, find Duke investors. Help us judge in the Duke Startup Challenge. We have about 150 student teams that compete in the Startup Challenge every year, and we are always looking for alumni judges. We've had about 300 alumni help us in the past year and make some productive connections tonight. So with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to uh, our planning committee here and have them take you through the rest of the program. So, Great. Thank, thank you, Howie, and thanks, everyone, again, for coming out, and thank you to our panelists. Uh, I'm John Miles. I was uh, Trinity 2000 and Fuqua 2010, uh, and with me, uh, Megan Gallagher. Yep, I'm Megan Gallagher, and I graduated from Fuqua in 2011. And Alex Cutler graduated from Trinity in 05 and uh, Fuqua just a couple months ago. Thanks, Megan, and thanks, Alex. Um, of course, tonight would not be possible without our wonderful group of panelists. Uh, some of you may know today is actually a Worldwide Kindness Day, and I think in the spirit of that, uh, we can see how kind the uh, panelists are being tonight. So uh, with that, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves. So first, we have David Beisel of Next Few Ventures. Hi, I'm uh, David Beisel from NextView Ventures. I'm an uh, entrepreneur turned VC. Uh, NextView is a dedicated seed stage venture capital firm focused on internet investments along the Boston to New York corridor. Typically, we'll invest up to about 500K into startups which are raising their you know, first seed round, a million, million and a half dollars total. Uh, we just do internet, just do seed, and just on the East Coast. Great. Thank you, David. Uh, and next, we have Thomas Learman of Master Street. Hi, uh, Thomas Lehrman. I started a company in the late 90s uh, in the uh, investment research and consulting world, a company called Gerson Lehrman Group, and then spent a number of years doing some other stuff, uh, public service, and then I uh, ended up getting, coming back into the entrepreneurial world uh, back in 2008. I currently run a small company that's focused on essentially helping entrepreneurs and business owners identify the best possible local professional service providers, so we work a lot of entrepreneurs here in New York. We're just focused on New York. And I do a fair amount of angel investing as well here in the city, and, and David and I have gotten to know each other through those circles. So. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and then we have Ryan Spoon from ESPN. Hi, I'm Ryan. I lead a digital product at ESPN, so properties like Watch ESPN, Fantasy Football, uh, Score Center, etc. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, on the investment side doing early stage tech investing for Players Ventures and leading Dogpatch Labs, which was proud to host this a couple times. Thank you, Ryan. And next, we have Matt Whitheiler of Flybridge. Hey, guys. I'm uh, I'm Matt, and a special hi to my mom who's watching on YouTube. Just kidding. Um, so uh, my name's Matt. I'm uh, Trinity 03, and uh, I'm with Flybridge Capital Partners. We're an early stage venture fund, historically based in Boston. But as of two months ago, I moved to New York, and our firm opened an office here. So we now have three of our seven investment professionals who are now based in New York because we're quite excited about what's going on in the city. We do C in Series A to start, and we're life cycle investors. So we do seed to Series, uh, um, you know, exit. So Series A, Series B, and continue investing and following on. Great. Thanks, Matt. And Catherine Minshew is also joining us tonight. Catherine? Oh, hi. Um, I'm Catherine Minshew. I was Duke 08 Trinity political science major. Um, worked in McKinsey and then in Rwanda and uh, then founded the Daily News, which was here last year. With our program. I guess more about it in a minute. Thank you, Catherine. And then Howie Lerman. Hi. Uh, I am going to get out of the light. Can I just ask a quick question? How many people went to Duke here in some capacity? Okay, good. How many of you started a company? Leave your hand up if you started a company. How many of you are thinking about starting a company? Okay, good. I like to see that. I started my first company uh, as, a, as a junior in Irwin Square in apartment number 28. That company sold, so I started another company after a roaring, raging kegger at the hideaway where I met my wife. I bleed Duke Blue. I'm an entrepreneur at heart, but I bleed Duke, Duke, Duke Blue. I'm the founder and uh, CEO of Yext. Yext. Yext's mission is to put perfect location information into the hands of every consumer. And we represent about 100,000 businesses. We're actually across the street with about 150 employees. We're growing like crazy. We're hiring like crazy. So the, the, the quick commercial here is if you, if you want to work for a great growth company, give me your card after this. Um, but I'm very excited to be here and, uh, and, uh, and want to thank Howie for putting this on. 
Thanks so much, Howie. And lastly, Chris Lasala from Google. Hey, I'm, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Chris from uh, Google. I'm a uh, class of 98, uh, the Fuqua School of Business. I'm um, currently on my fourth, I guess, career at Google now, uh, responsible for new product commercialization for uh, North and South America for our publisher-facing products. But I've, um, I've had three other interesting uh, and very unique different experiences at Google. Um, before that, running our mobile business development efforts, uh, where I was actually asked to build a team to uh, compete with Admon. And then we ended up, and then we ended up buying AdMob. So that was kind of a more of a it was an interesting, it was an interesting twist. Um, and before that, I uh, built a local reseller channel where I actually worked closely uh, with Howard. And um, and before that, I built our agency strategy. But uh, happy to be here. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, as you can all tell, some really interesting and impressive background. So we're looking forward to getting your feedback uh, as the event goes on. So thank you. And we'd also like to thank our sponsors who also lead Duke Blue, uh, Google for hosting the event here at their offices, and then also Credit Suisse for backing the food and beverages for the evening. And to say a few words on behalf of Credit Suisse's commitment to the venture community, entrepreneurs, and the tech sector is uh, Steve Geller, who's the managing director in the uh, TMT group, the Technology, Media, and Telecom group, which is the group I work in at Credit Suisse. And he is, more importantly, also class of 94 from Trinity. Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's not unusual for me. I cover the tech sector, and it's a little strange, though, that I am probably the oldest person in the, uh, in the, in the, in the building tonight. Um, I guess what I would say is we, at Credit Suisse, we're very uh, focused on, on looking out for new companies and, and, and funding new companies and advising new companies. Kristen here, uh, she went to UVA, um, so I won't hold it against her tonight. But um, uh, what I would say to you guys is, as someone who advises companies in the tech space, there's always new industries of Evolving and new segments evolving and new disruptive technologies coming out. And it's always exciting to see people like you come up with new ideas. Um, and it's really, really looking forward to seeing you tonight. The Duke game against Kentucky, I know you probably know it's 9 30 tonight, which is a little bit past my bedtime, but for you guys, uh, after the event's over, hopefully you can see the game. So look forward to hearing your ideas today. Thanks, guys. Also, uh, really, really excited to have Catherine Minshew here, as you got a preview of a second ago. So I met Catherine, I guess, a there you are, a year ago at this event, which she won, and uh, and then I've also worked with her on some Duke entrepreneurship planning stuff with Kimberly Jenkins, and now I see her every week on every tech blog in New York, along with Howard. So it's uh, it's really cool, and very happy to introduce Catherine Minshew. Great, thank you so much. Um, awesome, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, what I figured I'd do is just um, give you guys a little background of my company, uh, my sort of relationship with, with, uh, with Duke, and then do a little bit of Q&A. Um, so the background, quickly, is that I actually, um, as Alex said, pitched here, I think September of 2011. Uh, we had been live for maybe a month. Maybe it was October, actually. So we're a very, very baby company. Uh, met our first angel investor here. I think two, three of our first five investors were actually Duke alums, two of which I met through Duke Gen. Um, we went through Y Combinator in January, graduated this past March. Um, so yeah, I'll walk you quickly through the muse, what we are, how we've evolved, uh, what evolved, hopefully. And, um, and then we can get to there. So this is the muse. We make your career more awesome. So we start from a very simple question. People ask themselves all the time, what do I want to do with my life? And we have a problem because most kids are raised with a very, very limited set of options. So this is me when I was three years old, very cute. Um, I wanted to be a fireman. Not because I really had any idea what it meant to be a fireman or an engineer or a lawyer, but because I had heard about it in books or maybe I knew someone who had been or was that group. It's basically a problem that affects a lot of people. We have a massive population, not only are there 80 million millennials, but people kind of all up and down the career ladder are actively job searching, possibly job searching in some cases around 80% of the population, according to Bureau of Labor Estimates, and yet they're not entirely sure what career it is they're interested in. So for example, company culture, who you're working with, who you're working for, what the atmosphere of a team that you're going to be joining, these come up again and again and again as the absolute top factors that determine job satisfaction. There's almost no way to find them from traditional career sites. 
this is a typical listing on monster.com. As you can see, you may be interested in joining Prudential. You're going to have very little idea of what you're getting into until you actually go and interview there. And most career sites follow the same pattern. You can search for Python engineer or business development associate or anything else you want. You will get 40,000 listings. They will be a logo and two paragraphs of text. So we are very, very different. Uh, you can see our profile of Dell on the left. This is LinkedIn's profile of Dell on the right. Um, as you can see, even a professional networking site does a great job of telling you who you might know at Dell. does a very poor job of telling you what it's actually like to work there. We are a photo and video-based company culture discovery platform, job search platform. We help people optimize their professional lives in a variety of different ways. So people come to us to peek inside great companies. This is our profile of AOL. You can see what the office is like. You can look at some of the employees. Um, you can watch videos of people talking about a typical day in their life. For Sephora or any of the companies, you can kind of click to go more inside. Where do they work? What are their social media handles? What are they talking about? Uh, what's a typical day in the office? And then you can dig into some of their employees. So for example, here you've got Lance, editor-in-chief of Mashable. There's a video of Lance talking about what he majored in in college, how he sort of found his way to Mashable, what his career path has been. Then for every profile, once people get excited about a company, they can do all of the available jobs that are tagged to that profile, apply to them directly through the site, and then browse a whole host of career content, employment content, job search, leadership, how do I negotiate my salary, what do I do if my boss is a bully, A to Z career content that is crowdsourced for us uh, by experts on a volunteer basis. We collect great professionals with interactive profiles of companies, with this crowdsourced content, and with data-driven recommendations that tell people, if you like this, you may also like that. If you're interested in this company, you may also be interested in these, you should consider these career paths. Our target market is actually really interesting. So for those of you who were here a year ago, when we pitched, we were focused totally and completely on women, 22 to 35 years old. Uh, that was what we knew. That was what we thought would be the most exciting. As we've grown, it's actually been fascinating to see how many people uh, our, our demographic has resonated with. So in the last year, we have 2 million users um, in the past 13 months, which is pretty exciting. Uh, they started being uh, women 22 to 35. We then saw a lot of women in their 40s, 50s, of reaching out and saying, I think you're missing a huge opportunity. This is fascinating. There's nothing like this for me. And we started to see a huge uptick in men. And men actually now account for around 30% of our core traffic, which is pretty interesting. Total addressable market uh, we think is very massive. Recruiting is obviously a huge spend at companies. Not only are there lots of companies who spend on it, for example, Career Builder counts 300,000 companies as paying customers, but the companies themselves on an individual basis spend a tremendous amount. Um, I think $7 million is the average annual recruiting spend of a Fortune 500 company that trails down across the board, but everyone is hiring. And even some of the kind of hottest, sexiest companies have positions that they're trying to fill. Uh, have types, their diversity candidates or demographics they're looking to get more of, and they're going out and they're spending money on recruiting and hiring. So this is, I talked about this a second ago, 2 million users in our first year, uh, 457,000 of them were active in October. Um, we have jobs available right now in seven cities, but we're trying to expand that as fast as we possibly can, um, and it's been all organic word of mouth growth. So we have not uh, done any really paid advertising. Our users are really excited. Uh, these are some of the companies we've got. So corporations, McKinsey, AOL, Dell, Intel, tons and tons of tech startups, lots of nonprofits as well. Uh, we're moving into the fashion sector, getting a lot of interest from um, big, uh, big fashion brands. Gucci's coming on soon. And this is some of our upcoming pipeline. So this is the team. Uh, we're a team of all female founders, which is actually pretty unusual. We went through Y Combinator. We were the only such team. Um, and I think out of maybe 140 founders in our batch, 66 companies, there were seven women and we were three of them. So that's definitely been uh, a pretty interesting experience. We also have uh, a pretty diverse background. So I was Duco 8. We've got a Yaley, Harvard, um, Parsons, et cetera. And then what's next? Um, we're really building out the personalized recommendations. So one of the things I'm really interested in going forward is we see all these people who have an idea of some really sexy company that they want to work at. They want to work at Google. They want to work at Gucci. They want to work at the Gates Foundation. They have no idea how to get there. They can apply, and their resume may give them a callback, or it may not. But if we could surface for them where they could apply that was like that company, but 
hiring more aggressively, less competitive, a stepping stone. You know, if you work here, you have a substantially better chance of getting in to your dream job. I think that's information that's all out there. It's all accessible, but no one's providing it right now to individuals. We're really excited about doing that. That's the quick pitch. Um, and I guess at this point, I mean, we could do a couple questions if that's helpful or, uh, or anything else. So they don't. It's interesting, actually. We, um, oh yeah. So his question was, did the companies provide all the content? What we've done is we actually talked a lot to the founders of um, to of Airbnb while we were in Y Combinator, and I had actually rented out my apartment on Airbnb in New York before we moved to San Francisco, which we've since moved back from. Um, and I was really impressed that a photographer was sent by Airbnb, Airbnb, came to my apartment, shot all the photos in about 20 minutes, and left. And then I had these amazing high-res images of my apartment, which looked a lot better than the ones I tried to shoot for myself. Um, and while the photographer was in my apartment, I asked him how much he got paid by Airbnb to come out there, um, and he said it was $50 for the shoot. And so when we were looking at putting this together, we experimented with self-serve platforms. I know Glassdoor right now, people can kind of upload their own photos but the photo quality was pretty low and it wasn't the type of thing that people were going to want to browse. Um, and so there's also the risk, I think, of having the PR department kind of take over the profile, which is something that we did not want to happen. So right now we work with a network of photographers. Uh, we pay them a flat fee per shoot. They go in with a little Sony camera that costs about $350 and in, in an hour they're out. So they take photos of the office and then they do three 10-minute video interviews. Um, we have essentially a, a bunch of people who used to be writers for us who have video editing skills um, who work on an hourly basis so we can produce a profile end to end for $330. The companies pay a lot more than that. Now companies are relatively used to that. They pay for Glassdoor. They, um, what was the other site I was looking at recently? There's a couple of different places where they pay to present, uh, to essentially be, be, have a presence on the site, and then the review parts are separate. Right now we don't do any sort of reviews because we're small enough that we work with a relatively hand-selected group of companies because we're building up the brand as this is a place where you go to get a certain type of jobs. Um, as we grow, that will obviously change, but I think that for us, having a uh, having a kind of a window into the company doesn't necessarily replace doing informational interviews, um, asking people around, you know, what is it, what is it like to work there. But you do get really strong cultural differences. So when we talk to users, they'll say, you know, I just checked out Intel's profile and Dell's profile, and oh my goodness, the culture is just different. Um, Mashable and Tumblr are the same. I've never talked to someone who's looked at both of those profiles and felt that they wanted to go to work for both of those companies. But it's not not that you know, everyone likes one or the other, it's, um, it's very, very personal. So we're focused more on that first screen. If, you, you know, if you've ever interviewed for a job and it's kind of like that first day, not first day, but the, the, maybe the third round interview, you walk into the office, you meet three people and you go, oh my goodness, I don't want to be here. Uh, we think we can save a lot of time. And hiring managers are telling us that they're getting candidates that are just much more excited about being there and much more attuned to, um, to the kind of the cultural the companies are really different. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you for the questions as well. Um, it's exciting to see how far Catherine and team have come since being uh, at this event last fall. So thank you again, Catherine, for, for that. Um, so just a quick, now we're going to get into the competition uh, segment of the evening. Uh, a quick overview. Uh, six teams will pitch. They'll have uh, six minutes to complete their presentation, uh, followed by three minutes of Q&A. Uh, we're going to have two winners. So we'll have an audience choice, and we'll be doing that via text. And then, of course, we'll have our choice from our panelists uh, to my right. So. Uh, with that, uh, Alex is going to give you a sense of what's on the line tonight in terms of prize uh, and uh, what you know the ultimate winner will, will get out of this event tonight. So, Alex? 
Hey, sir. So uh, aside from a lot of glory on uh, National Kindness Day, uh, they're actually going to get a meeting with Josh Felser, who is an entrepreneur turned VC. He now runs a $25 million seed stage fund out in the Valley. And uh, he's actually been awesome to work with from a lot of FUCA students. I know some of you guys in the room have interned with his fund over the past couple of years. So really excited about that. And then Naval Ravikant from uh, Angel list has agreed to uh, to make some special connections within uh, Angel List. I'm not going to say anything binding because Howie knows the relationship better than I do, but you'll get something special from Angel List. So hitch hard, my friends. All right, let's kick things off with Keith from Federated Precision. Howie and the Duke Gen team, I, I want to warn you, I'm from the South, so it's very difficult for me to talk quickly. So what we're going to do I'll go through a few highlights and then I'm going to show you a video and importantly the video was created we had a team of Duke undergraduate interns this last summer they put together a promotional video for our company it's really great actually so what is Federated Precision we are a group of entrepreneurs 3D designers um, engineers and technologists and we actually do something very unique in today's economy we make things so what is the problem in today's manufacturing uh, uh, business? The U.S. manufacturing base is broken, lacks innovation. It's kind of steeped in what we call second uh, uh, industrial revolution uh, technologies. And so what we believe is the beginning of the third industrial revolution in advanced manufacturing. We are in that space. We're making real objects for billion-dollar supply chains. And so we're making medical devices, we're making parts uh, for Boeing and aerospace, we're making energy parts. So if you think of quirky uh, as they are for kind of the novelty uh, retail market, I've already hit my minute, um, I'll go quickly. We're kind of like quirky for OEMs. We're building a network uh, and we're investing heavily with this round of financing in 3D technology, 3D printing. Uh, so what makes us dis different, we've raised real money, five and a half, close to five and a half million uh, last year. We've got, uh, we'll have over a million in orders by the end of this year. Um, we're projecting seven million for next year. We have customers that you will recognize when we've created jobs. My partner and I are both Duke MBAs and have decades of experience starting companies, running organizations, doing business with real companies like J&J, &J, Mako Surgical, Aerosonic, Teledyne. And uh, I'll get straight to the, uh, to the video. But we're raising two and a half million right now. Federated Precision is an American precision contract manufacturing company that specializes in the fields of aerospace, medical devices, energy, and defense. The American manufacturing industry is growing. The demand within the precision industry has increased substantially over the past several years. We are entering a third industrial revolution in which data transfer will become completely digital. Design iterations and collaboration are becoming increasingly efficient because information can move around the world at lightning speeds. Federated Precision has combined the necessary high-tech manufacturing capabilities and an IT-driven business model to fully take advantage of this developing digital revolution. U.S.-based manufacturing companies have realized that outsourcing is not as cost-effective as previously thought. With transportation expenses rising, increased risks involved in outsourcing intellectual property, and communication barriers slowing potential iterations, the cost advantages of outsourcing are rapidly declining. When Boeing was building the 787 Dreamliner, supply chain issues overshadowed the whole production process and caused a five-year backlog of orders. The precision parts industry needs an efficient, fail-proof way of getting things made. Federated Precision's supply chain is built from the ground up to be fast, scalable, and robust. We utilize the latest technology and organizational techniques developed by the U.S. Navy SEALs that our founder and CEO, Samuel Havelock, has learned during his 20 years of service. Today, manufacturing companies come in three different sizes, small, medium, and large. Most manufacturing companies are small. They have a lifespan of about 30 years, which turns out to be the average working time of a job shop owner. These job shops are not designed to scale. Large manufacturing companies hold a large part of the market. They're able to produce high quantities at the cheapest price. 
What they lack is the ability to react to change and produce small batches of products effectively. The medium-sized company is the most interesting and profitable model. This is what Federated Precision is. We will be able to rapidly respond to product and market changes, have the ability to produce low-yield, high-profit parts, and be able to scale. In manufacturing, the human aspect is often forgotten. This is an important part of our business plan. We benefit strongly from being located in the United States of America. But we realized that only having one factory in the USA was not enough. We developed a hub and spoke business model to solve this issue. Federated Precision plans to implement satellite sites with a tailored number of machines based on demand while further expanding through smaller customer service centers strategically located in close proximity to our clients in the epicenters of the respective market segment hubs. This way, we can offer unparalleled support while easily building lasting relationships with customers. Co-manufacturing or co-factoring are terms Federated Precision has coined to describe the process of actively partnering with customers to collaboratively manufacture objects through rapid, iterative cycles with participation from all stakeholders. The main way to survive in the American precision manufacturing industry is to be reliable and fast. Our customers will stay with us when we fulfill these requirements and our reputation will benefit immensely. There has become a severe lack of available skilled workers within the American manufacturing industry and demand for this workforce has rapidly grown over the past several decades. We plan to circumvent this problem by utilizing a Navy SEAL based training program that will allow us to create our own skilled workforce. Instead of waiting for workers to come to us, Federated Precision works to recruit unrealized talent that can be developed into a highly efficient team of engineers. Our employee retainability will be very high because of our scalable model. We offer much more upward mobility than other companies in the manufacturing industry. Anyone can buy the machines that we have, but few people can design the scalable infrastructure, recruit and develop engineering talent, and generate the deep relationships with our clients like Federated Precision. Join us as we lead the third industrial revolution and bring manufacturing back to America. Okay, I might have gone over there. But uh, that, that's the uh, story in a nutshell. It tells a lot better than I do. Um, I don't know if we have any time for questions. Okay. And we'll take a minute out just for the extra time. So two minutes for questions. Uh, so the, the I think obvious question, which is the market opportunity, the financials, a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. The market opportunity, so we created the business plan because of the supply demand imbalance in the aerospace industry specifically. Boeing forecasts a $4 trillion market between now and 2025. Um, and so our initial target was aerospace. About 20 to 23 percent of everything that goes into a commercial aircraft is precision parts. And that's and that's what we make. Um, so it's a billion dollar uh, uh, industry in aerospace. It's also multi-billion dollars in uh, medical devices and energy, oil and gas, and also nuclear as far as we move. So uh, on top of that, we're investing heavily into 3D printing, which we believe will eventually one day be up to 10% of our total manufacturing base, which would make it a trillion dollar market. Um, and so while you see 3D printing that is mainly made out of plastics, we're using, we're going to be using the powdered metals, titaniums, super alloys, uh, parts that actually go inside the human body, go inside aircraft. Financials, um, you're looking at 30 to 40 percent EBITDA margins on a run rate. Um, and uh, right now, we've got a, after, over the past six months, we've had about 700,000 customer orders, and uh, those customers are, are big customers that can each give us several million dollars for the business next year. 
just a small point of feedback. Um, so I think the financials are important. I think when you give a pitch like this, why are you raising two and a half million? Where did the five get you? And then you're the star, right? The, any investor, if someone here wants to invest, it's you and it's hard to get to you from the video. And so while the video was really well produced. I understand, thank you. Good feedback. Next up, we have Zach from Ivy. All right, hey everyone, my name is Zach. I'm one of the co-founders of Ivy, which is enriching campus commerce by unifying and amplifying schools' campus ID-based payment networks. So by way of background, before we get started, all schools issue IDs to students and faculty. Those IDs are tethered to a prepaid account, which can be funded at the university bursar. And then that card can be used around campus to make purchases. So today there are 3,000 of these campus card networks all across the US. They're incredibly unique in that they do not run on Visa, Amex, MasterCard, or Discover Rail, so they're distinct payment networks. And there's no compatibility between schools here. Duke card and UNC card can't work together. They're tremendously powerful because every student and faculty has to have a card. Every merchant on campus has to accept it. And so in these campus ecosystems, they've boxed out all their traditional payments companies. So it should be huge assets for universities, but schools are just not payments companies. They don't want to deal with payment company issues like settlement, fraud, and merchant acquisition, and so on. So these cards are very limited in their functionality. They can just be used for swipe transactions on campus. So you can't do peer-to-peer -peer organization, online, local merchant purchases. And so to give you a feel for the lost opportunity, we all know Duke and Durham. And the Durham area had GDP measured by expenditure of $25 billion. Duke's network facilitated transaction volume of $25 million. So Duke, even with all the people it employs, all of its students, the wealth of all those individuals, only touched 0.1% of Durham area commerce. So that is an amazingly small percentage. And that's what we're working to improve with the university. We know they can't touch all of that. But if they touch 1% of that, that's $10 a day from everybody on campus. That's $10 million of profit to the university university's bottom line. So we do that by creating a mobile and web-based platform that builds on top of a school's existing campus card infrastructure. So a student can, or a faculty member, can take their card, link it to Ivy, and then use us to make peer-to-peer -peer organization, online, and local merchant transactions. So that means, from a student's perspective or a faculty member perspective, we're the first and only means to use this preferred form of payment more expansively. For a merchant, we're the most efficient and oftentimes the only means to access the value in these networks. And from a school, we're a totally cost-free, hassle-free means to extract value from this asset. And so what's amazing is you were doing great things for schools on an individual basis, but what's great is when you think about the opportunity in aggregate. And so, you know, we're targeting cities like Boston, where all born through university influence, we can create radiating networks, right? And over time, these networks will overlap and we can create dense areas of geographic acceptance and utilization of Ivy, all born through university influence. It's really like creating a payments company via the Facebook strategy of growth. And you can do this at an RDU in New York, in Houston, in Dallas, in Pittsburgh. I mean, there are 3,000 of these networks all across the US. And um, so if you think about it, we're really building the visa for campus cards. We're creating a unifying platform for campus funds and building a network out of it. So if you think about Visa, it enables somebody with a bank account to use their funds more expansively and serves as a single integration point for anybody looking to tap the value uh, inside, these, inside these accounts. Similarly, we enable a Duke student or an LSU student to use their campus dollars more freely and serve as a single integration point for a merchant looking to tap 3,000 of these schools and all the students and faculty. And in doing this, we actually sit in a relatively um, good position or very good position because we're the only campus card, we're the only system that integrates seamlessly with, with the school's existing campus card infrastructure. Um, we have our operating agreements with these great partners, which give us access to 2,500 of those 3,000 schools. So that means the integration is completely seamless. Um, and we satisfy all university demands, so we don't cause them to rebuild their infrastructure. We don't profit directly off the backs of students via fees like credit card companies 
companies or banks, and we don't put any excess operating burden on the university itself like a Square or PayPal would. And then with this, with this product, we're tapping directly into student and staff spending, which today is $300 billion. We're specifically going to focus on discretionary spend, which is $100 billion in and of itself. And if we access just 3% of that, we'll have $100 million of revenue via transaction fees. And you think everybody who's spending this $100 billion has a student card, is using that student card, has an account. So we will have unparalleled access to gaining these customers. And although transaction fees will be a huge piece of our business, it won't be the only means because that relationship in and of itself is tremendously valuable. In terms of team, it's myself and Sean. Uh, I am obsessed with the payments industry. I've built payments companies with Amex, Visa, and others. Uh, and then Sean has amazing university experience. He uh, built Duke's mobile platform. He built the mobile infrastructure of over 200 schools at Terribly Clever. They were then bought by Blackboard. Now he runs or ran most of their iOS development. Uh, we're being helped by David Allen, who's the former CTO of Visa, and Steve Keats, who's the former CEO of Mobile Money Ventures. And so so uh, we're, well, we're raising a, a small round, Sean and I are very, very cheap to keep alive, um, to just just build out the initial mobile product launch at Duke. We have amazing relationships at Duke. We've been working with them since the summer, and then this spring rolled out at three or four other schools. Thanks. I've got two quick questions. The first is, have you launched at Duke, or is that in the future? I wasn't sure. And the second is, um, how do you deal with people who say, I like using a student card that can only be spent on campus, because it means that the students aren't off there spending their money off campus at who knows what? Yeah. Um, so we are, we're not at Duke yet. We'll be there at the beginning of next year. Uh, we're going to roll out at the beginning of next semester. It's probably not great to launch right during exam time. Uh, and then in terms of the, the second question, you know, if you think about the way students can spend today, there are basically two ends of the spectrum. There's your student card, which can barely be used at all, and then your, there's uh, your bank account, which is a total black box for parents, right? And we, we create a medium in the middle that has some of the flexibility that students demand with the, with the protections that administrators and parents require. So how do you think about merchant acquisition? So obviously what Visa and MasterCard have done really well is made it so that every restaurant or store I go to, I can swipe my card. How do you think about acquiring merchants in Durham and in um, New York and all these other geographies? Yeah, so we are, there's, we can leverage university influence to drive adoption. Universities have an amazing economic impact over the surrounding community and we literally will be the only way that uh, any local merchant can tap the value in these in these networks. These are all prepaid accounts. They all have to be spent by the end of the semester. And if you don't use us or accept us, then you'll get none of that money. When you talk to the university, it sounds like you have a couple beyond Duke. What are some of the hesitations that the universities have expressed um, about you know implementing now versus wait and see how other universities are doing? I mean, it's it's for the for the most part, it's concerns over you know students' ability to somehow move the money out of the accounts and use these to buy drugs. <laughs> That's you know they all think about very very. Yeah, very, very extreme fringe cases. Um, so the, the credit card companies and all the upstarts like Square spend a huge amount of time with fraud. Yeah. How do you, what's your system for protection, your analytics, et cetera? Yeah, so so today these cards basically have no fraud whatsoever. Um, there is there's essentially nothing built in. There's no um, real adverse use cases to speak of. Chargeback, I mean, the, the mechanism of post-transaction whether it's fraud or chargeback, et cetera. To, to prevent that? To handle it. Um, well, first off, you know, the, the actual funding institution itself is on the line for any chargeback, so that really wouldn't be on us. But to actually prevent it, I mean, the networks themselves are relatively contained and relatively protected, so you don't have to, um, you know, you're, you're for the most part dealing with local merchants who know the students not that big of a risk, nor has there ever been. Uh, Anthony from Juvo. Hi there. My name is Anthony Versarge, and I'm the founder of Juvo. Even though most of us are, are more and more carrying around these really advanced smartphones, the 
reality is the call center experience really hasn't evolved all that much in the past 25 years. We're still calling companies, uh, listening to these automated messages, navigating through these really arcane uh, phone menus that seem to be go on for tiers and tiers and tiers. And we also seem to wait on hold for what seems like hours in order to actually speak to a live agent. There must be a better way. The solution is the Juvo mobile app, where our vision is to completely redefine the customer service experience for people using smartphones. We do this by leveraging four key features that are built into smartphones uh, that we can use to completely redefine the experience. So we talk about the camera. A picture is worth a thousand words. And and there are numerous experiences, so if I'm assembling the latest consumer electronics device or putting together a piece of furniture from Ikea, there's all sorts of use cases where being able to show the person on the other end of the line what I can see would be incredibly beneficial. We can also use the camera as a barcode or QR code scanner. So if I have a physical product like this monitor, uh, I can use my camera to scan that code um, and be connected directly to an agent uh, or a knowledge base to answer questions about that product without even bothering to have to dial a number and navigate through all these different menus. We also have the touchscreen interface on our smartphones, which we can use to completely replace those annoying menus that we have to navigate through and instead bring, a cons bring an experience to consumers that they're much more accustomed to from using a smartphone. So uh, buttons and navigation and searches and, and all these different types of things, uh, rather than being limited to that 10 button uh, touch tone dial pad. Connectivity allows us to uh, connect to mobile knowledge bases, uh, to external knowledge bases. So uh, this would be instead of speaking to an agent or uh, you know, in a case where it's after hours or you just want to learn about a tool and not actually speak to someone. Connectivity also means, however, that our devices are connected to our social networks, which opens up all sorts of opportunities for peer-to-peer uh, -peer help systems where my friends can identify themselves as experts in a particular space and uh, they can identify themselves as wanting to help their friends in a jam, and, and the Juvo mobile app enables that collaboration. Storage. Uh, it, you know, it, it seems whenever we call an 800 number or any kind of other customer service number, we're always sort of run through a, a first set of questions. You know, press one for English, two for Spanish, tell us where you're located. With the Juvo mobile app, we can actually store a very simple user profile right on the phone. Uh, things like your preferred language, um, your location, and so on. And when you initiate contact with the company, that information is sent automatically so you can get straight into what you're asking for. So get right into navigating to your specific product or even talking directly to an agent. So a little bit about our team. We've got some really deep industry expertise as well as some great experience in actually building and exiting startups. My experience, uh, spent a number of years at Accenture building mobile applications for clients in the, the media, entertainment, and telecom space. Uh, later, I, was, I worked at Avaya, which happens to be a, a global leader in contact centers and unified communications. My CTO, Jeff Marcus, uh, he's a former CTO of 24-7 Real Media, and since then he's been advising a lot of startups in a CTO capacity, some of which you can see listed here. Uh, we're also assembling a really great advisory board full of industry executives and uh, former consulting partners and so on. Our business model is really straightforward, so it's obviously going to be a, a free app that consumers can go and download from their respective app stores. Uh, we're going to earn revenue from the companies, so companies are going to pay to be on this platform, similar to the way they pay on uh, to be on something like OpenTable uh, or the Muse. And, um, they're going to pay, obviously, because they can offer this, uh, this service to their customers. So why are they going to pay us? Uh, we've talked to dozens of leaders in the contact center space, uh, people who run call centers at large companies, and across the board they tell us that they really have uh, two main objectives, and that is reduce costs and improve service. Fortunately, the Juvo app uh, lets them do both, and so they're really excited about that. 
Ju just a word here, that, you know, there's been a lot of buzz recently about consumers working with companies over social media, connecting over Facebook, Twitter, and so on. And, and these are really important emerging channels, but there still is really an important fact that consumers uh, prefer and um, typically use the phone as a primary channel for interacting with companies. So if you're a company and you want to improve your customer service, the phone is still the most important channel that you really need to get right. Our industry experts are excited. Uh, again, we've talked to dozens of them. Some of the feedback we've gotten is, is they, they really like uh, the innovativeness of our platform, um, and they really get the value proposition. That they see how this can improve their business. So we're, uh, we're seeking a $400,000 investment, and this is to help us accelerate the, the build out of our platform. So our mobile app, our integration connectors, and our agent interface. And uh, you know, we're looking to onboard two or three marquee customers in, in about a six month time frame. My question's about consumer adoption. So I don't I don't care about this until I need to care about it. Yep. So how do you reconcile the network effects that would be need to be in place such that you had a provider of a service that was able to do this and me frustrated at the point of when I need something to help help me understand consumer adoption model? Yeah, so so consumer adoption comes in, in a couple of different models. So it uh, you know it can be from from the actual companies um, you know making this available to their so on the back the manual, you know, look, you know, connect with us through Juvo on their website, um, and so on, or even talking to an agent uh, when you're talking to an agent, say, hey, I really wish I could show you this. Hey, download this Juvo app. You can help us out and do it. Then once the companies, uh, once consumers are using the app, similar to OpenTable, um, they can go and, and realize that you know, they can go and contact all the rest of their companies through the same interface, and get that uh, that enhanced experience. One, one quick th point of feedback, I guess. I, when you were talking through, you know, camera, touch screen, um, I desperately wanted to see pictures. Even if you don't have it built yet, um, I think this would have been even more compelling to me with some JPEGs of what it might look like because, you know, I, I hate sitting on the phone and I love the idea, but um, but if you can make it concrete for me, I think that'll get me, you know, that much more excited about, even if you end up just throwing it out and doing something totally different, like letting people see. Yeah, I, t I totally agree. It was more just a matter of trying to compress this into six minutes, actually, as opposed to walking everybody through some screenshots, but I, I agree. Is there an opportunity to integrate with other apps, and how would you think about that? There is. That, that, that's a great point, um, because one of the key features is that we can actually embed this technology into the company's apps, so people don't actually need to, to get, the, get this experience through the Juvo app if they're uh, working in a Comcast app or a Samsung app and, and click a Contact Us button. Um, we can embed this functionality into their application and get the same experience. Yeah, let I me mean, just expand a little bit on that. Like, how would you do that? How would it actually happen? Yeah, so, so you know, that essential, essentially that experience um, for for the company would be built, uh, you know, on a platform, uh, you know, on a server that would be accessible, uh, not just from our application, but from the, the native company's application. And, and there obviously would be some integration um, that would be needed there, but, you know, it, it's something that we're exploring and we think we could do. In the, for what it's worth, feedback category, as well, um, you as soon as you start talking about uh, customer service, I kind of tune out because I don't think you have any credibility in the space until I get to the bio slide. We are like, hey, I was a VP at Avaya, which is like a great company in the space, yep. and so it just made it really relevant to me. Um, because if you didn't have that experience, I'd be quite skeptical. But with that experience, um, I find it way more intriguing. So again, in the fraud it's worth, I would highlight that up front so people don't dismiss that. Sure, thanks. Next up, we have Stephen from Kiona Health. So, what is access to your healthcare provider worth? We've all been there. Your child has a high fever, has for a lot of hours, or your wife is pregnant and is suffering from allergies and the flu, and normally she's stuck up on meds, but because she's pregnant, well, what does she do? What's safe? Or in my case, my toddler woke up with blisters on her hands and her face. Hello, my name is Stephen Dean. I'm from Kiona Health, and I'm really glad to be here. And Kiona Health enables providers to give recommendations to patients with 
within seconds at the moment they need it, anytime or anywhere. Now, if you're like me, when you run into these situations, you often turn online. But also, if you're like me, you've often found that online can be more trouble than it's worth. We certainly did in our case. And so we did what millions of other Americans do. We picked up the telephone to call our pediatrician. Or we landed in voicemail, and a voicemail said, a nurse will get back to you within several hours. Well, that's not what we wanted. Now, had they been using Kiona Health, and we provide our solution as a software service to medical groups and to providers. Uh, the experience would have been very different. Now, even though I'm a Duke grad, I went over to the dark side and partnered with a UNC Chapel Hill company. We started and were available at uh, Campus Health Services, and today, students go on, they just click, I want to ask a nurse button, and they simply enter in what their issue is. They are given a personalized and branching set of questions based on the symptoms that they themselves are seeing. On the back end, our analytics take over. We run some quality checks as well as prioritization and give on one simple page for the nurse a summary of the patient's issue, uh, how to contact them, a short blurb of what the major issue is, as well as a copy of the entire interview. Everything the nurse needs to get back to the patient quickly over phone or secure messaging, a personalized message for that patient. Now, we were fortunate enough to start with a clinical trial at the University of North Carolina where we compared our solution against the telephone and also with people doing whatever they tend to do anyway. You probably already know that when most people choose their own health care or make their own health care decisions, they tend to overutilize care or make inappropriate care. And sure enough, nearly 50% of those who used our tool were directed to more appropriate care than what they were going to choose themselves. Um, telephone calls are a big problem for providers. Clinical calls in particular take a trained professional 10 to 15 minutes to understand the situation and give a recommendation back. Because we bring automation to the interview, we saved 43% of time on the part of the providers. And the nurses loved that. Not only that, but because we show the cases as the interviews are completed, nurses could say, oh, I can get, that, get to this in between my other activities. What typically happens is, because it takes so long, messages go to voicemail, and every few hours, nurses check the messages and call everyone back, which is what we experienced. But within a few seconds is a lot better. Now, we finished the clinical trial in May, and in the five months after that clinical trial, we landed five paid pilots with 50,000 in 2012 revenue. Uh, and this is how we'd go in and make the sale. Uh, you know how much your patients complain constantly about not being able to access you. Why don't you call me back quicker? How come you don't answer text messages, whatnot? But you also know how much time and money you spend trying to give them access over an old technology. Uh, our client, uh, UNCOB, gets almost 300 telephone calls asking clinical questions per week, and they spend almost $350,000 per year just trying to answer those questions, and that is non-reimbursable. So with our solution, you can get back to patients faster, make them happier, direct them to appropriate care, saving them time and money, while you're saving yourself time and money and spending more time on reimbursable visits. They're painfully aware of the primary care physician shortage problem, already 7% last year, and predicted to grow to 20% by 2020, and that was before the Affordable Care Act. So what you're seeing is a ton of patients per provider, and providers have to respond with less time, less money per patient. Some of them, you may have already read, more than ever before, looking around and saying, maybe I need to get out now. Already, 73% of patients say they can't easily reach their primary care doctor when they want to. And even more, the Wall Street Journal poll said that 62% of patients said they'd be willing to switch to providers if they could easily access them online. So if you want to stay in primary care, how could you not choose a solution like you? That helps you not only save money, but meet this growing demand that healthcare is facing. We've got the team to do it with combined experience in clinical informatics, consumer analytics, developing web and mobile applications in previous startups, and an advisory board that has over 50 years combined experience of delivering clinical information to patients remotely over new technologies, including Intuit Health, the world's largest independent patient portal, Kaiser Permanente, a leader in the space, and cutting edge research at the University of North Carolina. And I'm most proud of how far Kiona Health has come with so little. The money's tied to our clinical trial. We're only 170,000. We won some entrepreneurship competitions, bringing another 40,000 in, and everything that I've told you about was built with that money. 
We've landed some paid pilots, as I said. And today we are raising $500,000 in seed money. Thank you. With that, we will um, partner with uh, Allscripts, which gives us access to 40,000 doctors, expand to mobile, wrap up these pilots solidly, expand out our sales, and if uh, investors or any of you want to see your money go a long ways for a fantastic cause, and we've got even cooler things coming, uh, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you. Could you talk a little bit about uh, what are the size and shape of providers which are going to be early adopters and yep. who within yep. those organizations are, yep. are uh, kind of a target person you have to convince to have that implementation? Yeah, no, that's a great question because um, our initial thought was that because we're doing appropriate care, we should talk to huge hospitals and payers because they're the ones that benefit from appropriate care. But we've actually, all of our pilots are medical groups and we actually piloting across a range of medical groups so that the pilots themselves can tell us where to focus. We've got pediatrics, OB, geriatrics, and campus health. Um, and the initial data because for those is because all of those populations tend to be either young or have a lot of phone calls already. Um, where early indications are probably pediatrics would be the way to go, uh, but we'll see. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Have you thought about it um, being a, a learning system such that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you elaborate um, on that? Yeah, certainly. So he, he asked if it could be a learning system. And when you're dealing with analytics and you're getting so much data, there's a chance to, um, like we had to run a clinical trial, for example, because uh, doctors tend to be very, very suspicious. But with a large amount of data that we're collecting, we could learn without doing a clinical trial. And we can get there. Um, it just takes a large amount of data to really get to that point where that data is reliable enough to be to hit healthcare standards. What's the next step organizationally or or uh, technologically to go from trials to however you measure it, first 10,000 uh, right. clinics or whatever that, oh, whatever that measure is? What's the next step to get from here to you know full out deployment? Right, right. Um, well, we are, um, our short-term goal is to continue selling to the small medical groups because they have faster sales cycles um, and we can show operational value. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's uh, 10 providers or larger uh, would still be, because it's smaller than hospitals, it's smaller than payers, right? Uh, we're already talking, though, to um, some larger groups, ACOs, uh, payers, Blue Cross Blue Shield, for example, and large hospital systems. Uh, How do you have to adopt to get there? Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, that's a roundabout way to answer your question. Uh, apologies. So, um, what we have to do first is establish credibility. The faster sales cycles, the smaller ones do that. Two, we need to grow. We're only a four-person company right now. We couldn't support uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield if we wanted to, right? You know. So, um, it's a matter of growing with the smaller guys, using the data that we get in the long run to prove to the payers that, yeah, we're solving a huge problem for you, um, and we expect we'll hit them up. I uh, am not going to ask a question, apparently. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Megan. Uh, next up, we have John from Qualia. Oh. That's normal, apparently. <laughs> Hello, everybody. That's not distracting, uh -oh. right? You're fine. Not at all, right? <laughs> should we should we dig dig into this? All right, John. We're gonna start you from the beginning. Wonderful. All right, Wonderful. everybody. I think that's fair, right? Right, right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. We're all warmed up, though. All right. 
Good, everyone ready, everyone ready. All right, no more difficulties. Here we go. My name is John Njaku. I'm the founder of Quelia. I'm Trinity 2003. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, Quelia is data science for residential real estate. So my co-founders and I created Quelia because landlords don't have the right tools. I learned this directly having worked for some of the la largest landlords in the country. And I've even been a landlord myself, so you guys can trust me when I can say it's not easy work. Landlords spend the bulk of their time and they're not, and they're very good at operating their businesses. So you know, things like dealing with investors, finding that next new deal, accounting, property management, dealing with new tenants, dealing with current tenants. But because they don't have the right tools, they don't spend enough time operating, optimizing their businesses. So what this means is that the difficult questions such as, what is the optimal amount of time for me to make this lease so that I can maximize my profitability, right down to the more basic questions like, how much rent should I even charge for this unit? Get answered by either doing whatever you did last year, picking up the phone and calling that favorite yet potentially biased broker friend of yours, or worse yet, by guessing. At the end of the day, billions of dollars are left on the table. This is the pain in the market. We created Qualia to alleviate this pain by delivering simple, affordable, and beautiful tools to help landlords, property managers, and other real estate professionals make better decisions. Quelia is a next generation market intelligence platform. We sit at the intersection between big data, real estate, and heavy quantitative analysis so that we can finally deliver groundbreaking market intelligence in real time. So let me quickly unpack these three core components of our business. So unlike for sale real estate, where the law mandates that you publicly record all closed transactions and there's just generally more data available, this is not the case with rental real estate. So what we're doing is that through partnerships with entities like Apartments.com and Rent Jungle, and through our own proprietary technology that allows us to constantly crawl the internet, we're creating these large and never before seen data sets on rental markets. So to date, we've collected millions of listings in the cities that we cover, and we're currently collecting at a rate of about tens of thousands per day. We're building the largest repository of real estate listing observations ever created. But next is where all the magic happens, because to these data sets, we're applying sophisticated techniques like natural language processing, multi-level hedonic regression models, K nearest neighbor, loader regressions, etc., to make sense of these hairy data sets and to derive these valuable algorithms that help people make better decisions. So for example, we're able to deliver dynamic pricing as we're able to quantify each and every single attribute that is significant to a rental unit's price. Finally, we marry all of that quantitative information with a bunch of qualitative information in order to intelligently apply these analytics. So our first product is a revenue management application for landlords and property managers. We help them make better decisions for their rental portfolios. So let me show you guys what this looks like. The landlord begins his Quelia revenue management vision on his dashboard screen that's customized for his own portfolio. Yes, we are synced with their property management system, which has previously only lived in accounting. Here the landlord gets quick snapshots of his entire portfolio. From this screen, the landlord can get even more granular. The landlord can go for, uh, to specific buildings right down to specific units. This is the unit screen, and this is where we interweave our own cutting edge analytics. Additionally, we're giving the landlords, property managers, and other real estate professionals using this thing a real-time vision of what's going on in the market. Speaking of markets, though, the market for Qualia is huge. According to the 2010 census, there were 40 million units for rent in the United States. This represents about $366 billion of transaction volume. But despite the magnitude of that number, only 15% of all apartment units are optimized by some sort of software. This can be contrasted with airlines, hotels, and rental cars where there's near universal adoption. We're currently testing, refining, and uh, working with a small group of landlords that have an aggregate national portfolio of 50,000 units around the country. These, this landlord grouping includes uh, Campus Apartments, the, Gam the Galman Group, and Allen Dom Real Estate. These will become our first subscription customers. Let me tell you a little bit about the team because we've assembled a great team that encompasses the three core components of our business. So that's me, I'm the real estate guy. After finishing up at Duke, I did my JD at Stanford Law School, and I also did a Master of Science in Real Estate Development from Columbia University. Our big data guy is Greg. After finishing up at Cornell, 
Greg spent the past three years working in enterprise software for consumer uh, consumer packaged goods doing demand forecasting. He is no stranger to these large and never before seen data sets on rental markets. Last, but definitely not least, is our quant, Chris. While Chris was doing his master's in economics and finance at the University of East Anglia, he wrote his dissertation on suggesting alternative approaches to pricing airline tickets. It's on this alternative approach that Qualia's models are based. Become vetted. This time last year, we were incubated at Dream Adventures in Philadelphia. Through that program, we had the opportunity to be featured by the Next Web as one of the five most promising startups within that cohort. We then took the show over uh, down south to Startup Chile, where we had the opportunity to be featured in CNN and The Economist. We've also recently been featured in Eunice Magazine, which is the largest trade organization for the multifamily industry. We're excited because we're just getting uh, started. We're just scratching the surface. We're building a unique data asset off of which we're going to build several products. We're going to start with revenue management, but our goal is really to get in between that rental transaction between the consumer and the renter. We currently have an open round of funding at $1 million, a portion of which has been hard committed by Comcast Ventures. We look forward to talking to anyone that's interested. Thank you very much, guys. So I only know how to ask one kind of question. Uh, what's the size and shape of the early adopter customers? What do they look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Two big competitors in revenue management. One's called Yieldstar. They're part of a publicly traded company in Texas called the uh, called RealPage. Another is called LRO. They're part of a privately held company called Rainmaker Group. They target mostly REITs. We're trying to get the rest of the market. So the current pilot pool has an average between I don't know 500 and 5,000 units. We want to really flood this middle to large tier of of landlord to where pricing is that pain, and then go upstream from there. Can you walk me through a specific use case of how your pricing optimization beats the standard mean that they'd be able to get right now? Sure. I mean, so what we have right now amongst the, the competition, um, they basically were products made for REITs and by REITs. So they're, they're very enterprise 1.0. They're clunky, they're difficult to use, and they're expensive. What we do is we believe that our modeling is superior because our perspective wasn't made for, rent, for REITs and by REITs, but it was made from a market perspective. We're also leaner, we're in the cloud, and we're more affordable. And so one of the big differentiators is that our eye is towards the market and towards everything else that's going on in the market. These guys are basically uh, business processes kind of turned into uh, revenue management products. I don't think you mentioned it, uh, so if you did, I apologize. Uh, monetization, so how are you charging for it? Is it a subscription plus a cut or? Correct. Yeah, I snuck that in there. It's a subscription-based uh, product, uh, web-based kind of software as a service, that kind of model. Uh, now, what's the what, what's the price? We're playing with that right now. To be honest, we're doing customer development to figure that out. We're we're we're, we're the uh, the prevailing products are very expensive. Fifty thousand dollars to begin, and then two dollars to six dollars per unit per month. We're playing with whether we should do kind of a fuck a unit a month or basically tier subscription pricing. So we're kind of trying to rely on some customer development to really figure that out without putting a, a, a you know concrete price for that. Taking the, the delta, right? Right, and so that's actually another uh, another pricing uh, scheme that we played with is really just a success base. Hey, you know, work for six months, the dollars we save you, you guys can pay us a clip of that. The challenge with that with that is that we can give them all the information we want, but we can't actually put a gun to their head and say you guys have to use it. So that's a little bit challenging of a of a pricing model to rely on. That's exactly right. I mean, is that the primary decision we're trying? They're trying to optimize for a price. Correct. For the, for this one product, we we've you know given our development as a company, we started off as hey, we're only going to do revenue management. But we've seen as we've collected this data, there's a bunch of different things that we can do. We're just starting with revenue management, which the focal point is pricing and, and lease term optimization as well. So uh, you make the point of saying that. Uh I can't ask another question. Technical difficulties, I should. Damn. <laughs> but we can talk um, so just real quickly, my question is, as you look, or as you made the point in your presentation that airlines, um, hotels, and rental cars have all adopted pricing models. Um, but in my mind, the difference between those businesses and where you're focusing is that all of those businesses are very, very um, concentrated. There's not you know, 10,000 rental car agencies for you to go choose from, or 10,000 airlines. Whereas 
whereas in the real estate market, it's much more fragmented. And so I think that's what prevented companies from getting distribution inside or for pricing optimization in this space. And so I think one of the challenges that you'll face going forward that you'll obviously pay attention to is how do you get the long tail of real estate on board on this? I think that's a, that's great. That's a great point. Another another advantage they have is that they're more homogeneous products. Uh, real estate is very heterogeneous going across, and that's some of what, you know why we're here. This is what we want to fix, and we want to create this. Another big issue is data. There are places where you can go and get airline data or go and get hotel data. It's very difficult to get for rentals, and that's what we're trying to create, create and fix. But thank you for the questions. And then finally, we have Rachel from Seeds. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone here. Um, thank you, Catherine and dudes of the investor panel. Um, thank you to Google for hosting us. I think this bathroom, this co-ed bathroom is ingenious because I think it helps uh, guys, girls take not as long and guys be less disgusting. So a way to be more efficient and continue innovating in, in different areas. So um, I'm Rachel, I'm a Trinity 2006 alum. I'm the founder and CEO of Seeds, Farmville meets Kiva, hopefully this clicker works. Um, so here's what we're doing. So in terms of my background, um, I come from the world of finance. I'm a former futures and equities trader. I made more money than I expected to in my early 20s doing that, but it was unfulfilling and I was almost always the only girl. So I think I was interested in um, ways to empower female entrepreneurs that were also good investments. Um, so what that led me to was launching the Microlending Film Project, which was a global exploration of the impact of microloans on women, which was shot on four continents. Here's where we shot, including in Detroit. Um, we had this really kick-ass team that we put together that were largely volunteers who just responded to the idea and knew that I didn't have much money to pay them. But what was really amazing is that when we were filming in Kenya last year, um, check this out. Sorry about that. So for those of you that don't know what microloans are, they're tiny loans, $25 or smaller, that you can make to an entrepreneur, usually a woman, in a developing country that empowers her to launch a business and she pays it back. So check this out. But in Kenya, they're innovating even further. What this woman is doing here is she's purchasing produce at a stand using text message. So cell phones in many places are more plentiful than clean water. And there's people that live in the slums in, in Nairobi, in Kibera, the, the second largest slum in the world, have access to cell phones and they can use text message to make payments. You can also make microloans to cell phones in the same way. So seeing that, it was amazing. And I came back to the States after we were filming and thought more about how we could connect this, this amazing innovation with other industries. So if you look at this, I mean, global microfinance is a huge industry, multi-billion dollar industry, 10,000 MFIs globally. Social gaming is also a big industry. Zynga is a, it's a huge it's a huge company, right? Seeds exists at the intersection of those two things. So if we contrast these, though, so Kiva is a nonprofit. It's the the best known web based micro lending platform in the world. They move two million dollars per week. That's just movement of of micro loans. It's not revenue. In contrast, Zynga brings in three hundred and forty million dollars per quarter in revenue, largely through virtual goods sales. So there's a difference of a factor of thirteen. And, um, but you might ask, like, how are these two things related? And the answer, counterintuitively, is, here we go, women. It's not 12-year-old boys who are playing social games, as I would have assumed. The average social gamer is a 43-year-old woman. The, of people that play World of Warcraft, which is the largest multiplayer game, like, in history, um, the largest purchases of virtual gold are women over 35. So these people play games and they spend money in games. And what's more, they're interested in microfinance and they're interested in empowering uh, female entrepreneurs. So there's this great demographic cross-section that we saw we could take advantage of. Um, some of you know Jane McGonigal who wrote Reality is Broken. She's a sort of a game theorist. She says that three billion hours are spent per week globally playing games. So if we were to just harness some of that and to embed the Seeds API, the application programming interface, so that other games are equipped to facilitate micro lending, we could transform the world. And that's what we're working to do with Seeds. So to that end, here's the game, right? Um, yeah, so here's some of the game design. I gotta read off my card here. We're communally building a civilization while simultaneously micro-lending to entrepreneurs. We're growing a home for the zeeple, the plant-like creatures who inhabit the world of seeds. Ah, uh, sorry, it didn't start at the beginning. Um, yeah. 
So, the Zeeple, populate this world. Um, you can purchase decorators for the Zeeple's homes and for them themselves. And uh, the Zeeple can even uh, pass down genetic traits to, to their offspring. So it's just this playable world with these creatures. And as you're, as you're working with them, you're also making microns. So that said, um, here's some screenshots of the game. The 1.02 version of the prototype is already in the App Store. Um, I went with a team of five Dukies, undergrads and grad students, and myself to Nairobi this summer. We built it out, we got it functional, we dispersed the first batch of microloans, we've, we've uh, successfully collected seven repayments, I think, since. I also got arrested, but that's another story. We're building out the 1.03 version in the next three weeks with, uh, with the help of a Duke Comp Sci class, uh, a bunch of seniors right now. So money is pretty straightforward. We'll show you this. So you're playing it on your iPhone. You can bring in your friends via Twitter and Facebook, buy and sell virtual goods. Money goes into an account here, to an account in Nairobi. It then goes to a cell phone that is manned by our loan officer, Lydia Dola. She disperses it directly to the cell phones of borrowers in the field, and they make repayments using text message. Business model, multi-pronged business model. So these games make a ton of money because they sell virtual goods. We're doing that, we're also selling ads and decorators, and we're monetizing impatience. So by that I mean, in the game, if you wanna build another level in your house, you can wait three hours real time in the house of the Zeeple that you're, your Zeeple that you're playing with or whatever. Or you can pay five seeds dollars to do it immediately, which costs one real dollar. And in such a way, we incrementally bring in a large amounts, hopefully large amounts of revenue. Um, also, micro lending, we disperse them. We disperse loans at half of Kenya's current uh, current market rates. I gotta hurry up. And um, we repay the loans to uh, people that make the loans at virtual currency because they assume that once they put real currency in the game, that it's gone. So we can continue reinvesting the principal as well as the interest we're collecting. All right, we're already generating revenue. I gotta get to where, where we're going next. Team is legit. Here are partners that we're working with. Press is good, more coming. I think we're out. Um, I should say that we have Zynga's former tech lead for iOS who brought Mafia Wars and, and uh, Farmville to iPhone working with us. Um, what's up next is building out the iOS team. I'm gonna keep going unless you stop me. Hiring a CTO we've already identified. So, All right. so help me um, understand the revenue model. It's um, uh, virtual goods. Is the virtual goods and the uh, the micro lending are they combined? I missed that as we move through. Or like, are they separate decisions as a consumer? They are. So what we're doing is we're monetizing the game in traditional ways, which includes sale of virtual goods and decorators, and monetizing impatience as well as ad sales. And then separate from that, we're we're soliciting micro loans to different types of businesses rather than to individuals. So if someone Someone selects, say, handmade goods and says they want to make a loan to entrepreneurs in Kenya making handmade goods, we'll make sure that those loans go to those types of borrowers. The rest of the money we're bringing in through whatever, um, virtual good sales and such, we, we make decisions about how to reinvest. So essentially, we're bringing in money in the same way Zynga does and then reinvesting it at 13 to 15% uh, for the profit that also empowers entrepreneurs. That makes sense. Uh, social gaming is an intensely competitive space. How do you think about what unfair advantage you have in distribution? So what's going to make us survive? We, we aren't going to make it, even if we make a really awesome game, um, games have a, a life of three to six months. It's a very hit-driven industry. So what we have to do and what we're going to do with your investments is build out our um, partnerships with games to embed the API in other games. So again, the big vision, the ambitious vision is re-envisioning what gaming needs. So what if every game embeds the Seeds API? What if kids in the future think that gaming means, oh, it's this fun thing I play that positively affects somebody, you know, that also makes money. So we can offer a revenue split to every game that we're partnering with and embedding the Seeds API in their game. Um, so in that sense, I think we're, we're finding a niche and we can, um, we can offer the money while we're doing it. Ryan Spoon never gets to ask his questions. I actually, I think the most important part of the whole presentation was that last part you just said, which was the API focus. I think that's the yep. biggest. My question was the same as yours. It's not only is it competitive, it's remarkably expensive. Yep. 
you need to raise a ton of money to even begin to advertise. But the API part, I think, is what's unique and, and distributes you in, and also, frankly, to people like Zynga, who know how to monetize, it provides a compelling layer to play, right. which then you can monetize. It can also help Zynga, who has sort of gotten a reputation as being kind of evil, it could help them reinvent their image. Um, because they get, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's the most kind of profound part of the presentation. I agree. Spend more time on that if you sat down in depth with the investor. Okay. I think has done a little bit of this before, right? So hurricane relief, uh, earthquake relief in Haiti. Yeah, uh, Laura Pincus Hartman, who is Mark Pincus's sister and the head of their philanthropic arm and in talks with becoming one of our, uh, our advisors. Yeah, she headed something after, after hurricane relief in, uh, no, it was after the earthquake in Haiti in 2010. They sold virtual goods and it went to relief in Haiti through the game. It was cool. All right, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Megan, for coordinating. Uh, so you've seen all six present now, and uh, what we're going to do now is have the audience vote. Megan's going to take our panelists uh, to an area where they're going to kind of deliberate uh, and review all six, and then ultimately come back um, with their decision. But we're going to have the audience vote as well via text. So if you could all take out your uh, turn on, or if they're not on, uh, turn off, uh, turn on your cell phones, and uh, walk you through how we're going to do this. So this is kind of a sample slide, uh, but pretty self-explanatory. You're going to uh, draft a new text message. Um, and what's going to, in the message is the body, the body of the text, you're going to have a number, and you'll see samples there. And they're going to correspond to one of the six companies that present tonight. Uh, the company that you'd uh, like to choose yourself, you're going to enter the number of that company in the body of the text. If you're going to call up your draft uh, text message, you're going to your two your two field is going to have that number two two three three three. That's just that's your address, right? You're going to send the text to. Um, then, based on your decision in the body, the message of the text, you're going to enter in um, the corresponding number for the company that you have chosen. Uh, quick note: those watching at home can also do this. Uh, we just ask for no one to uh, really for only those who are viewing this can vote. So uh, please don't encourage friends that aren't viewing this either online or here to vote. So again, just to repeat, um, in the two field, you're going to enter uh, 22333, and then in this body, you're going to enter the corresponding number. Give you a few minutes, so take your time. And just to note, you can only vote once, and the system is, uh, is designed that way, so no multiple text. We have a winner, that would be Ivy. So Zach Abrams of Ivy. Thank you, Zach. Thank you all for, uh, for doing that, appreciate it. We'll see what the, uh, the panelists come back with. Thanks guys, so now we're actually gonna bring all the speakers up, so if you presented tonight, come back up, and we're gonna do a Q&A with the audience, so sure you guys have a lot of questions, doubts, concerns, uh, we want you to air them now. Uh, so if you're in the back, holler loudly, and we'll uh, repeat the question so everybody else can hear it, and then uh, pass the microphone. Lee. Sorry, uh, you'll be relying on the school names and networks to do it, but at the same time in college towns you're talking about very, very small merchants who it's very difficult to, um, you know, ha uh, take on new card systems. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was around merchant acquisition, particularly focused on local merchants and the difficulty of acquiring them. And so we are at first primarily focusing on the on-campus commerce piece, so that's the organization payments, right? That's how we're gonna drive adoption from students, and then we're gonna focus online, where we can target a few key merchants, like barnesandnoble.com or Ikea, for instance, right? Merchants that have a particular interest in the university space, in which case you can gain a handful, right? And you don't, and, and and acquire massive amounts of transaction volume. Over time, we want to become an accepted form of payment basically in everybody else's digital wallet. So the success of Square or Google Wallet or 
serve, right, can enable us to, to be accepted at merchants. We can just piggyback off of, off of others' mobile wallet acceptance. With Quelia, um, have you looked at doing anything kind of like a predictive uh, analytics for for the for the for the rental companies for buying properties, or you know, looking at if you have all this rental data, seeing this this house is, is undervalued, you should you know, this apartment's undervalued. Have you looked at that, or is that future plans? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. The question was, have we looked at uh, doing predictive analytics for the for sale market as well? And the answer is yes. Um, um, we we started off as I kind of alluded to when I was answering one of these questions. We started off as a purely rentals and purely you know revenue management, and our scope has since widened since we've moved along. At the end of the day, it's just data, right? And it's a different variable, and we have the ability to kind of uh, to work with that stuff. So that's definitely uh, in the cards, and we look forward to to working on that as uh, as we move farther. More questions. My question's for Juvo, because I call helplines and I'm, and I'm on hold forever because I don't give up. Um, you talked about the touch screens and going through those uh, hierarchies on your touch screen. Um, a lot of times, my experience with uh, call centers is you give them all this information, what's your bank account number, what's your zip code, where are you, and then the agent confirms it all on the phone. They basically ask you again. Um, is that something that the call centers do on purpose? Is there a lack of information and how do you kind of not waste both parties' time by repeating some of the same questions? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the call center a bit as to whether or not it's that's sort of their policy and something they, they always do versus something they, they just opt to do um, or, or have to do. But uh, you know, the key way that we prevent that sort of data repeat from happening um, is a couple of scenarios. Uh, first of all, by, by storing the profile on your device, that automatically gets sent up at the, at the uh, beginning of the contact and it is popped up on the agent screen through the agent interface. Um, secondly, you know, if something's not stored uh, in your personal profile on your device, all of those things that you um, enter in through the touchscreen menu also get sent into the agent, and that data um, then gets passed along. You know, if you do happen to get passed from agent to agent, that that information can get passed along as well. Needs. Um, so the API that you talked about at the end definitely seems extremely powerful and really versatile. Um, are you going to limit yourself to the on or the gaming and apps community? Or are you going to move on to um, to basically any other platform, or is it just uh, limited to gaming right now? That's a great question. I mean, gaming is a huge sphere already. Uh, we'd love to take it in other areas. So if you have ideas, Mark Ewing, please share. Yeah, I mean, it'd be great if we could embed this in, in everything uh, imaginable. Yeah. question is for Kina Help. Um, how much personalized information are you getting from uh, your patients? And have you considered re regulatory um, such as HIPAA when you're oh, getting yeah. some of this oh, yeah, information? Oh yeah, yeah, we've got to be HIPAA compliant, yeah. So we collect um, an enormous amount of data as far as patient symptoms go, but what is stored on our servers is de-identified. So nurses know what the patients are, but when we're running analytics, uh, you know, like uh, what the question uh, was earlier, like could we do even better than uh, the current question systems and figure out ways of predicting people's uh, uh, issues people might be facing? We can, but it's the identified data. Um, it's, for a startup, HIPAA is uh, crazy, overbearing, but you know, we have to do it, so we're doing it. questions out there? All right. There's one right behind you. 
and also for Kiona Healthcare. Uh, how are you uh, assembling the information for the sort of the protocols of the, of the, of the information that leads the nurse through, or the patient through the, you know, the question sequence? Is so there something that already exists out, out there right. for that, yeah. that you're leveraging somebody yeah. who's already created that? Or are you inventing that yourself? Um, it's a mixture of things. We've licensed two different protocol sets, uh, gold standard, uh, one from the Mayo Clinic, one from a place called Schmidt Thompson. Um, and as we work with different clients, um, doctors create their own too. So the more clients we have, the more we'll have. And you just by piloting, for example, inside of a PEDS, uh, an OB practice, a geriatrics practice, we're getting all sorts of protocols that even the licensed sets that we got uh, purchased don't have. So it's uh, you know it's it's creating something that hasn't existed before, and it is one of the more um, interesting things that we think the future holds for Kiana. One last question. Got time for one more? Absolutely, and you know, as, as I said, the for us as a business, we want to start off tackling that middle to large, and even you know, moving out into the burbs, those garden style units that really need to find that optimal price in order to really get a leg up against kind of the better capitalized and, and more institutional landlords. So that's definitely in the cards, and those are definitely the guys um, that have been the most supportive. Uh, you know, our one pilot client, he has 5,000 units um, right outside of Philadelphia, but he's been the most instrumental because he's been pitched by all of the big boys and uh, you know he's like I can't afford a hundred thousand dollars up front and then thereafter to continue to use that but I see the value of this and I'm really excited to help you guys get to where you need to uh, to work for it so the answer is yes definitely smaller um, garden style suburban guys are who we really want to target initially question so uh, the gentleman in the front here you want to ask her yeah uh, no we, we have competition I guess in the precision manufacturing space but the question I'm sorry. Is anyone else doing what Federated Precision is doing? And the answer is no. Our, our model is scalable, which is, is hard to find in our space. It's a very antiquated model that you see our competitors using. It's usually one location. Uh, a good mature location is doing between 12 million and 25 million in revenue with high EBITDA margins, but they don't know how to scale. And so the secret to scale in this business is a labor force. Um, you can buy another machine with 0% down you can't find anybody that can run it. So it's a technical labor force. They're really technologists, people call them machinists. Um, but we have a proprietary training platform based on the Navy SEAL training platform that allows us to scale the business. And so no one is doing that, and no one's pushing into 3D printing like we're going to, and uh, no one's going for a geographically distributed network model either. sit down over in the judges' seats. We're actually going to have the judges give you guys feedback now. And as a quick plug while they're getting set up, I just actually joined the board of Duke Gen uh, in New York, and I think there's a lot more stuff in the future that uh, we can do like this. I know a lot of people enjoy these events and, uh, and don't feel like we do them often enough. So if you have any ideas or you want to get more involved, please reach out to either me, I'm Alex Cutler, or Megan Gallagher, or John Miles. Uh, we're really excited about kind of the future and building Duke Gen into a more robust uh, group up here. So please reach out to us in the future. All right, so before they reveal the winner of the evening, they're going to give feedback on each of the teams. Take it away, guys. 
Great. Um, so I'm first. I'm giving feedback to Federated Precision. Um, overall, I think um, you, know, you as a presenter were actually, for me, much more compelling than the video. Um, I think when when you were speaking, I was kind of excited to um, excited to learn more. And so I would I would definitely say um, first point of feedback from the group would be, you know, as we said in the at the Q and A. Um, you're selling yourself as a founder, and it's as someone that people are going to back and put money in and develop a relationship with over time. So, um, so kind of, I would say definitely double down on that. Um, ultimately, I think the the pitch didn't fully kind of answer some of our big concerns around um, the fact that there is, you know, a major North American competitor. Um, I think with Celestica, uh, the the low margins of the business, and kind of convincing us that this is really a, a venture backed type of opportunity. But overall, great job while you were speaking. So I'll do uh, Juvo. Um, so I think you did a good job setting up the uh, uh, the issue and the problem and, and, the, and the consumer need. Um, it's absolutely a big market. There are a lot of people thinking about how to uh, kind of expedite and socialize, uh, probably more lightweight customer service. Um, what, I, what kept going on in my head is to do this, you need to be built for everywhere. Because for someone to kind of integrate customer service, you need to be a solve for all customers, right? So in a mobile environment, that means you need to be great on iOS, on Android, et cetera. And that gets really complicated really fast, particularly with a small, you know, overall small venture raise. Which then led me to think that the bigger opportunity is actually, and someone on the, not me, asked it, and I think it's, it's very interesting. How do you integrate with existing apps? How do you, through an API, tie into things like Comcast's app um, and then serve on either a call or an integration basis? Um, I think that solves your long-term need, still addresses a full-size market, and probably lets you operate in a much leaner model. Um, and I think that's really interesting. So I'll go with uh, with seeds. So um, I think all of us here totally felt compelled with the vision around, hey, can we take all the stuff that's happening in social gaming and marry it with um, uh, marry it with a nonprofit giving back kind of well, you're a for profit, but marry it with the nonprofit model. Um, and so uh, I think all of us really like that. I think the, the I think the. Um, I think the challenge that we faced as a group was you spent a lot of your presentation talking about the product that you built, and it wasn't really till the question and answer when you mentioned that there's an API model here and you want to integrate this with other players. And as a result, I think that we kind of missed the big vision through the presentation and uh, think that there may be something there in the API model if you can get guys like Zynga or other game programmers and game providers to integrate your API into their platform. But we didn't really hear enough about that in the presentation presentation to be able to make an informed decision. Uh, Stephen, Kiona. Um, so, you know, we thought in, um, that you did a real good job of articulating the consumer need here. Um, the business model is sort of predicated on the need of the, the service providers. So where, um, particularly uh, with healthcare, the uh, the need to sort of access and, and quickly find out what's wrong, I think as a consumer, we, we all understand that. So I think there's a model and there's a potential consumer engagement. I was particularly intrigued with the uh, the, the way you're thinking about sort of becoming a, and we talked about this, the, an algorithm that learns such that you can get pretty good at actually based on the questions, the answers and questions of like actually targeting on what, what's wrong, right? And if you do that perfectly, and if that's your angle perfectly, you actually eliminate the need to make a phone call in its entirety, right? And drive that cost down to zero. So um, we are, we are, there were some big gaps in the presentation that caused us as potential investors cause for concern. Uh, we skip, you skip, you skip things like uh, the regulatory environment, which is obviously a big concern, particularly if you're selling to a, to a provider. Um, um, the competition, as I understand it, although I'm not an expert on it, this is a reasonably robust and competitive environment trying to do things like this. Um, and then just the general 
overall sales complexity. Right? So in order to win, you're going to have to get um, Blue Cross, et cetera, and the large providers and like selling those massive sales cycle to do that. Um, so uh, where I think there's, uh, there's a nugget there um, is that if you were to successful in capitalizing on the consumer side of the business and gathering the information, uh, there's, a, I think, an easier pivot because then you'll have this trove of data uh, with which then you could do whatever you want. And maybe it's not actually a revenue model that's based on cost per call, but a revenue model that's based on something just around the power of the data that you have. John, Quelio, where's the, is the like thing going to start ringing again when I start talking? OK. Let me just take a step back and give some general feedback first. Uh, I didn't see a single product demo. Um, and generally, I like to show, not tell. And you know, probably among all the judges here, I spend all of my time pitching all day. So what I love to see is not just, hey, we're great, but I just like to kind of quickly imagine trying to, for example, describe Google. Well, it's a you know it's an algorithm that that returns you answers and it uses PageRank by by sourcing citations and creating all this kind of stuff. No, just show it, show the relevant results. So just jump and show. That's just kind of a general presentation thing. So we we don't really talk, we just show. John, okay. Um, I thought first of all, amazing job going through the adversity of the ringing going. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in Ben Harwitz's office and the computer doesn't work, or you know there's something that's wrong and something breaks. So that just the tenacity to make it through your presentation. You were, you were, in my opinion, by far the best presenter. Now, about the about the business model. I don't know how that's going to look, but I can tell you this: everything in starting a startup, in my experience, by far everything is one of is the common is a confluence of matching amazing founders that have the tenacity to respond and the courage to continuously iterate and pivot over and over and over again. Because what you think things are going to be today are completely wrong, I can guarantee you. But if you have the, the right team in place and you're going against a big market, then you, if you, in a, and you look at what's going on, you read the market signals and you begin to react and do all kinds of crazy things that you see what's going on and then, and then iterate and you're able to release software. And even though you totally bullshitted me on the answer to my question about how you actually, d d how you actually deliver, you know, I asked you how, you how you actually deliver a better price and your response was, well, the other, our competitors serve REITs. Like, like if you just keep going and, and your team is good, then, then that is going to be the most defining factor in your success. And, and so, um, and so my, my feedback is, uh, you seem awesome. It seems like you had an awesome team with the, with the big data guy and the quant. And, and look at the market and, and be willing to constantly challenge yourself and, and change what you think might be right and challenge every assumption all the time. And uh, Ivy, last one. So we thought it was a very innovative idea, right? Here, here you are extending what is a private payment network um, outward, right? And so the business model is already established. It's a clear payments business model. You're going to take a small part of a big pie. But on top of it, your customers are one of the main constituents universities. You're not asking them to give you money. You're going to show up with a check, right? Now, that's pretty interesting. Um, and then we didn't really talk about it too much, but uh, you have a positional advantage, right? Once you've locked in with universities, it's going to be pretty hard to unsee you from the universities. You know, on the negative sides, uh, touch upon in some of the questions, the merchant acquisition is, can be very capital intensive. You talked a little bit about channel partnerships. I think you're going to really have to emphasize those because if you're going to go door to door to get all the merchants around universities, I think that's going to be a challenge. Second is around uh, payments issues, just fraud, uh, chargebacks, blah, blah, blah. All the, you know, Anyone in this industry has to deal with all this. You're going to have to deal with it, too. Um, that also means more capital. So the, the two things were capital and then more capital. And then, uh, I mean, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, right? And then a uh, question around size of market and what's truly ad addressable. And we had some debates within our well, cohort for you know, for a minute or two on what 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 the answer is there. And so it means within the presentation, we didn't, it wasn't resonating enough to that this, is this really a big market or is this kind of a small niche for a few college students? So the winner is Ivy. There you go. Congratulations.
Thank you, David. Congratulations to Ivy. And uh, so before we conclude uh, the sixth uh, Duke, Duke Gen Angel Pitch event, uh, just hold your applause for a sec. But let's give a big, uh, actually pause right now, big round of uh, applause to our panelists because they're standing right here. Thank you all. Um, Obviously, you saw six uh, different companies, uh, six different presentation styles. But again, come on, big round of applause to our presenters tonight. We put a lot of work into these presentations. <laughs> Lastly, our sponsors uh, to Google, where we are right now, and to Credit Suisse. Thank you both uh, for you know giving us the space and all the coordination that went to make the, tonight happen. Um, please, on your way out, you see them on your chair. If you can fill out an event feedback form, uh, we really appreciate that. We've alluded to this tonight, but you know the Duke Gen Network is growing. It's now you know around 5,000 people. Uh, please, if you're not on the LinkedIn group connect there and feel free to connect with others and, and you know try to get uh, seek help when and if needed again thank you all for coming out tonight thank you all for watching online uh, it's been great to have you and thank you again for presenters and panelists thanks produced by duke university online at duke.edu